Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three upcoming old school essentials adventures that I kickstarted and that should be coming out sometime relatively soon. Um, I'll put links below to where you can, where you guys can like you know get notified about them as they come forward and keep an eye on them. But they're not out yet. I want to say sorry it's been so long since I did a video. Uh, I basically just took the entire month of July off and then um, the things have gotten really crazy. <laughs> I mean off from the channel, not off from work or anything like that. Things have just gotten really busy and uh, I don't know how regular I can be in, in, in you know producing these videos, but I'll do what I can moving forward. Um, I still want to keep things up as I go. So today, as I said, I'm going to be going through three upcoming adventures for Old School Essentials. The first is The Secret Vault of the Wind Windswept Island, which is a level a adventure for levels 1 through 3. This is PDF is only 40 pages, but it's a really cool adventure. The second one I'm going to be going through is The Horrendous Hounds of Hendenburg, which I've actually reviewed the Cairn edition of this before, which you guys can go get for free right now. Um, I, I believe it's either free or pay what you want out there. But this is a kickstarted version of it, it's been updated, it's been expanded, and it's been converted over to old school essentials. So you should check them out. This is by the Merry Mushmen. Um, they did uh, the, um, oh gosh, the, the, the Curse of uh, the Hollow. I forget what, what that one was called before. Um, I've, I've reviewed it in physical copy before. I kickstarted it a while back and I got the physical version of the zine. Um, but you should check that one out, it's great. I'll try to put a link below to the actual name of it. I can't think of it offhand. Um, but this is by the same people, the Merry Mesh Men. They're great. And then the next, the last one is Raiding the Obsidian Keep, which is uh, also for old school essentials. Both of these two, uh, Horrendous Hands of Hendenburg and Raiding the Obsidian Keep are 37 pages each. So these are not huge, huge campaigns. These are short adventures, but they're really cool. So let's go back to Secret Vault of the Windswept Island, which is a deadly adventure for characters level one through three. What you're gonna see throughout is beautiful art, great design. The dungeon is pretty linear, the dungeon's pretty straightforward, but there's a, there's a few tricks and traps and backtracking going on, so it's a really cool place. Uh, you got some really cool maps for it. Uh, it's gonna be on a spread form, but these are on the two pages, so if you get the physical version, you know, this will be the cover, the inside cover. You get uh, areas one, two, three, four on the one side, and then you get Area 5, 6, and 7 on the other with a, uh, you know, um, dungeon key and the page numbers that you need. Now the PDF is, is hyperlinked, which is great. Of course, that won't be hyperlinked in the physical version, obviously. <laughs> but still, uh, it's pretty cool. And I like the art, how things are drawn on the map so that you can, it's not just a blank room, but you, you, you kind of remember what's there, right? You've read through it. You can look at the map and you go, oh yeah, that's right. That room is this room and this room is that room. So it shows you right on the map what you're looking at. Here's the uh, front page with another table of contents here. Um, uh, the introduction to the adventure. Uh, it's a short fantasy horror adventure about a forgotten death cult's dungeon deep below the surface of a lonely wind lash island. So I love island adventures. I love... Uh, islands are great for me, at least, and for a lot of DMs because you can... They're, they're literally self-contained little locations, right? So it's like hexes. You can just put them anywhere you want. Um, if you do a, uh, certainly if you do anything like a, an island hopping adventure, then you're great there. Um, so it's for character levels one through three, but it's supposed to be deadly. So um, you should be, uh, you know, keep that in mind. It's it's not like an easy level one through three adventure. It's a difficult one. Now I like how this goes. There's a few there's a few really cool bits here in this introduction. You get the setting details, the background information that you'd need, um, the NPCs that are important here. And then the hooks the players can use, but also unanswered questions. That's a really cool idea to put this right away so that you know that there's stuff that the DM or that the adventure doesn't answer that you as the DM has, has to come up with. You have to, you have to answer. I think that's really cool. Uh, you know, notes for tips for how to run the adventure, how to run the ritual that's going on in the background here, and also um, how to maintain pressure on the players. Uh, a life force tracker is included. <laughs> Um, because sealed within the dungeons, once you're sealed in, you have to contend with pressure and then there is, uh, any characters who die become ghosts, there's this opportunity basically to be resurrected before the ghost completely drains away. So basically if a player dies, they can come back if that timer is, um, if the character I should say <laughs> dies, they can come back as long as that timer hasn't run out. So that's kind of interesting. You could have a, 
you know, first level characters are probably not going to care so much. But if you have a third level character who's here, they probably would care and want to get that character back. And so uh, that's, you know, that's something you, you can definitely pr uh, press them. Now, one thing that um, I don't know, I, I have mixed feelings about is that the rewards, it's just gold coins and other valuables have, have values intentionally left undefined for the referee to reward players as they deem appropriate. I, I, I understand why that's done and I like that. It adds a little flexibility to the adventure. It's also, I think, nice to kind of just put it in there and be like, here's what this adventure is aiming at, especially since you have a system. It's not system neutral, since it's old school essentials. Having an actual gold coin value, giving the GM or the DM, hey, this is what this is going to be about in terms of XP rewards and that sort of thing. I, I like that better. But anyway, um, some rumors. You got to have some good rumor tables. And, uh, and there are some interesting ones here. Um, gelatinous cubes can subsist on extremely little for decades, so probably some gelatinous cubes in there, right? Death deity disciples can traverse the dead realm. Okay, so if you do something with the dead, maybe you can come back from the dead. That, like, there are, some, there are some things here that are really useful for the adventure. I like those. I really like those. Um, there are some others that are a little less interesting to me here. Um, now, prayer, for example, prayer to a lawful deity on the island protects from the curse. That's one of those rumors where unless you, if you just give it to the player and say, here, use the rumor you start out with, uh, that's not cool. If it's part of like seeking out information and they're talking to NPCs and they talk to an NPC who probably doesn't know what they're talking about or who is hyperzealous for a lawful god and you know, obviously their prayers will always work anywhere, then I could see that rumor being good as long as the, as the players can look at the source and say, okay, should we trust it? If it's just DM fiat, here, you start with this. This is a rumor about the island. I always feel bad about those, so keep that in mind if you're going to run these uh, false or partially true rumors. Uh, here are some descriptions of the outside of the, of the island, the, the beach and the summit, and how to approach it. I like how it's laid out. It's very clear. Bolding, hyper, uh, uh, I should say, uh, bullet points and bolding make it very, very clear what you're looking at here. With the Crimson Ant Swarm, monster stat block set in black. Very, very easy to read. I like this quite a lot. Um, very well designed. This whole book is very well designed. A Cornered Merman. Tide Pools, a submerged grotto, the Murky Lagoon. Um, the Path to the Summit, the Giant Hermit Crab. Again, really, really cool. Uh, just easy to read. I think that's really cool. Also, you notice at the bottom of every page, there is a um, page number, but next to it is the name of the area that you're looking at, which is very helpful at a, at a glance. Great piece of art there entering the dungeon. There's the ant swarm coming at the players. Dungeon details, general dungeon details. Unlit stairs, stone doors, ancient script. Really cool stuff. And I love the layout of the of the rooms and the map. Again, you have the map on each page. Very easy to, to, to understand where you are. And you have in red where you're coming from, what are the areas connected to it? Area 5, Area 3, Area 2, and the South Beach and Windswept Summit. So you know exactly where you're going. You're very easy to navigate. Now, these aren't hyperlinked. I'm, I would like that, but that's okay. It's definitely not a big, big deal. It's very easy to read as you go through. And there's great art, great art on each of these rooms. <laughs> I love these like hieroglyphs on, in room 2, the gemstone frescoes. Really cool, and look, I like how there's a little bit of a, there's a little map in the top right of these this two page spread. So again, if you have it in physical form, you're going to open up every two page spread. You're going to have a map and some artwork and some and the room details. Really cool. The pit obstacle with a gilded chest at the bottom, spiked pit. Great idea. Classic trap. The ceiling shaft and the mountain nourished cube. I love that. It has subsisted on very little for many many years. An emaciated and especially difficult to detect gelatinous cube specimen. That's cool. Ruined glass corridors is a really interesting uh, trap, sort of, or like extended trap. Arcane runes, corridor traps, and uh, spirals to the center. And again, you get, you've got great art that, on, on these two parade spreads that shows you at least a kind of a hint of what things are supposed to look like. So if you need a little bit more flavor for you as the DM or for the players, you can describe what you're, what you're just looking at. I like that a lot. The Great Hall of Red Sand. This is room five. This is to the right. I like this a lot. And again, you have on the map that little key there, which looks, if you look at the piece of art, it looks kind of like what you're looking at there. And so you're going to remember, if you're just looking at that first page, what's on each room. But you don't have to remember because it's all right here. Very easy to read. 
the ceramic bowl of bones. That reminds me of the Black Cauldron or something. Really cool. Reassembling skeleton, forever reanimating skeletal remains of wretched humanoids, condemned to an eternal undead existence by the death deity. They're slow, can always be outrun. That's an interesting fact. Nearly imperishable, and they're undead. There's a floor, floor tile puzzle in here. An extra planar vault with a red agate statue and sil solid statues of silver knights. And the ceaseless stalker with an ornamental sword in the middle. Bloodthirster. You get some magic items. Bloodthirster, which is a magic item, is a cursed sword with a special purpose. It's a very cool. It detects humanoids, detect magics. You can see invisible creatures as a blasphemous blessing. And as alignment power, lawful foes hit by the sword must save versus spells or perish in a terribly gruesome display of melting flesh and viscera. In one turn, the skeleton rises again as a reassembling skeleton. The sword must be used to slay one humanoid every 72 hours or it will soon control the wielder to act out its endless desire for violence. So not something that you're probably going to use as a lawful character, but certainly if you have a chaotic party or if there is a villain who wants to get this, or perhaps you're trying to keep it away from someone, or you're trying to destroy it. It'd be a great magic item to have to seek out. The apostate key. When held by ghosts, that's really cool. It's a sentient mace. And ghosts. Souls trapped by a convoker. Their incorpor incorporeal existence in the mortal realm is prolonged for a brief time. And how they work. Unique reassembling skeletons. So if you want to have a really interesting skeleton that comes to, because they keep on coming back, right? They're going to be slightly different each time. That's a cool table to have. Sea salt crystal exposure. What happens if you're exposed to this? Um, there's some interesting ones here. Involuntarily shed crystal tears for 1d6 plus 1 turns, but can read languages as the magic user spell for the duration. Or, a favorite weapon made of salt crystal grows over the entire arm. Whoa. Or a capricious and playful halfling-sized figure of salt crystal sweats from body. It likes to steal items and be chased. These are really weird, but they're cool. You could certainly have them in a certain tonal game. You have some pre-made characters here at the end. Sam Killjoy. And True Believers, for the people who kickstarted it. The gaming license and the Life Force tracker there at the end with the back page. So the Secret Vault of the Winds Swept Island. I uh, highly recommend you guys check this one out. It seems like a great adventure. I'm gonna, I haven't run it yet, obviously. Uh, I just got it just a few weeks ago. Um, haven't had a chance to run it, but it is cool. And I'm building up more and more and more and more island adventures for my inevitable pirate campaign and this is definitely going into my pirate campaign when i eventually run it all right the next adventure as i said is the horrendous hounds of hendenburg now there is a cover page i didn't uh, it's separate it's a separate downloadable file and i just didn't think to, <laughs> to put it on here but you guys can, can check it out they'll have tons of art on the links that I'll, that I'll include and there's art in this book that's great so the horrendous hounds of hendenburg now if you guys have seen my um well, that's a great piece of art if you guys have seen my review of the uh, Karen version of this, you'll know the basic idea. It's the same thing, but it's been expanded, and that's the note here. Um, converted to OSE, developed, some of the locations are developed, and the Tyrant's Tomb has been extended from nine rooms to 24 rooms. So it's become a full dungeon. Nine rooms is a pretty small dungeon. 24 is fairly big, and that'll take you a few sessions to get through. So, really cool. The Hounds of Hendenburg. Great piece of art there. So essentially what you have, I'll read through the introduction this little bit. Terror roams the dark and brambled paths of the cryptwood. A pack of giant demonic hounds rule the night, savaging those foolish enough to brave the forest. The villagers of Hendenburg cower in the shadows of the ancient boughs as each sunset heralds new horrors. So there's some bandits, there's some witches, there are mercenaries and adventurers who like to be called knights. And then there's the townsfolk and lots of cool people in the town. It's a really well-developed town, a really well-developed set of factions, people, and intercha interchangeable connections. And essentially, you have this, this uh, lord, this tyrant, was killed. Oh, he died, and his hounds oh, were famous for being horrific and horrible. And, and uh, basically, these bandits uncovered the tomb, accidentally freed the guy within, and now the hounds... Uh, he's bound, the, the evil guy's bound, but the, the hounds are roaming around and the villagers are getting eaten and they need help. So, lots of cool things, lots of cool ways to approach this. There's different ways of defeating the hounds and it's open-ended. There's no objective, though no objective is assumed for the adventure, it is likely that most parties will wish to rid the cryptwood of the hounds. There are three ways to do it. The priest can conduct a ritual, the crones can help, or you can make a, de a deal with the, uh, the tyrant if you free him. 
it will it, it works but uh, probably a worse a worse fate in the future um, hooks the wounded bandit a different different hooks so I can read through them all but the wounded bandit offers information in exchange for his, for his freedom he claimed that a ruined manor within the crypt holds the key the treasures of a long dead tyrant so there's a whole bunch of hooks that you can throw in here um, I love that piece of art such a good one it gives you a sense of the cryptwood and how it relates to the village of Hendenburg. Tight growth of trees. I remember the art that was chosen for the Cairn edition was public domain, but it was really good. I liked it, and this fits with it. It's 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 obviously drawn for this. Very unique style, but it fits with the adventure and the tone of it really, really well. A great map of Hendenburg. I love how this works. Now, it's not hyperlinked, but that's okay. Again, hyperlinked maps... Um, are just like my thing, <laughs> but they're not necessarily, uh, ne they're not needed for sure. A description of Hendenburg, the law, economy, and how it can fit into your setting, the people of the village, and a lot of great information here. Um, important areas are, um, are important things are uh, underlined, which is cool. So particular locations, um, heretical ideas is, uh, is underlined because down here there's a bit of information about those heretical ideas. A lot of great information here, with along with rumors, D12 rumors, um, for the village. And D12 events and encounters, which is also great. I like that quite a lot. Um, so, there's also, you notice, 15 of them, even though you roll D12, because if every time you get one, you want, uh, you want if you roll the same one again, you do the one below it. So, um, eventually you can get all the encounters, but you can't get, what that means is you can't get 13, 14, or 15 until you've had a few encounters. That's kind of cool. I like that a lot. Um, in, for example, you can't have 15 until you've had at least one, two, three other encounters, right? Because you have to have those others first. That's an interesting way of doing random encounter tables where you make the encounter table. Yeah, just it's a great idea because you're not li you're not likely to get 13, 14, 15 at all because you'd have to basically roll 12 a bunch of times or roll a bunch of earlier uh, um, adventures and, and eventually get there. So that's really cool. I like that a lot. Um, an interesting, an interesting way. Linnebeth the coroner, Widow Winstaple. Doug the bounty hunter. <laughs> Kathy Ann the prospector and that goose. It's a great untitled goose game. That's what it reminds me of. And you get a hex for the cryptwood. Great hex map. Beautiful with the locations drawn directly on the map. Uh, you can see exactly what we're dealing with. Numbered well. Uh, this is a fantastic hex map. It, you know, just... Cl uh, um, I would say this is one of the better ones that you get out there. <laughs> the, uh, you know, this is this is the um, the uh, baseline. This is what you should aim for in terms of drawing a hex map that's clear and easy to read. How to travel through the, heck, the cryptwood, the different river crossings, and uh, encounter rates, hunting and foraging, all that stuff. The cryptwood is ancient and hungry, seeking always to devour the works of man and return to its primal, primeval state. Brambles and sprawling roots trip the incautious. Light struggles to breach the dense canopy. Here and there are white bricks of unknown antiquity, choked with ivy and brittle with age. The great description. Encounters in the Cryptwood. You get a good 20 encounters. And it's just a straight up D20 roll. And now there's a reaction roll uh, uh, as well. And in particular set locations. Great piece of art there for the creature in the water. You get the pond with the Grindylow, which is the thing there, I think. The uh, Hendenburg itself, which we've already had a description of. The gallows, the giant dolmen, the reluctant hermit, the hideous hags. Oh, they are the crones. They're terrifying. The troll bridge, classic troll bridge. It's a very fairy tale in its tone. Oh, yeah, this is Sly George. I love this. Uh, great piece of art there for Sly George and his uh, his lady. What's her name? Valor Valeria. Valeria. Uh, you get the Widow's Grotto. You get the Thirsty Sprite. The Ring of the High Roller is one of those things you can get. Uh, and then there's an interesting little uh, side note here. I don't know where that applies. I have to find it. But it says time to bust out another adventure. So obviously uh, somewhere on here. Uh, there is a hook. Oh, there it is. The armoire, dripping with icicles, leads to the lands of fairy. Oh, gotcha. Okay, it's right here. It's the armoire in the Thirsty Sprite. Well, that would fit with any number of adventures I've reviewed on here before. 
uh, and that means that this fits into a lot of different games. This is one of those ones that I, I am, you know, you could easily fit into a Dolmenwood campaign. And Dolmenwood, is, the physical release is just a few weeks away, I think. So it's on my mind. This would be a great adventure to fit into Dolmenwood. It connects right to that. And you have the troll, you have the crones, and you just have just this very fairy tale sense. There's pixies in here. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got some actual dungeons. The Invested Silver Mine with the above ground and below ground uh, locations. The mine itself, there's giant spiders down here, or brain spiderlings, ugh, gross. There's a powder room with skeletons, a strange fossil, some corpses, a blind king's throne. Ugh, horrifying, the queen's lair, brain spider the size of a pony. Great, the ancient villa. This is where the tyrant sleeps. With random encounters, roll a d10 every other turn. You're going to have a lot of encounters. A lot of encounters in this place, because most of these seem like fights, right? Feral lairs, 2d4 giant bats, vengeful, vengeful apparitions, rats, mournful apparitions, highwaymen, flying monkeys, ghostly screams. Well, ghostly screams, I suppose, are. The ground shakes, um, and a discard of rusty boar shed clangs as if kicked by an invisible foot. So there are some that are not so combative and you're going to be rolling i think a random encounter or um, you know reaction tables for them anyway you get what those what the fights are to the right of it here's the manor itself the manor grounds it's pretty straightforward but also really cool and then you get the under dungeon the dungeon itself with some death masks corpse fish down here in the cistern in the basement torture room trophy room and then you get the tyrant's tomb so the villa is not the same thing as the tomb. I, I, I made that mistake. I thought it was. They're different. That's the, 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 uh, the villa is its own thing with the dungeon below it. Tyrant's tomb is separate. You got an automaton, the tomb guardian. Five rooms here on this floor with some great art there. Horrifying. And the chained king to the left in that piece of that fresco. It's great. Lucretia's Lyre, the ghostly beauty, loyal wife of the Cryptwood Tyrant. Bigger dungeon down below, with different ways down. That's awesome. So it's not just the one path. I always like that in dungeons. You have multiple ways down. There's a golem control room. Pretty awesome. Belinda the Bloody, experienced fighter. Chapel of the Boar God. And the Cryptwood Tyrant, great piece of art there, especially the background. I love the background in each of these pieces of art. The character art is good, too, but the background art is fantastic. Ending the adventure. If the party does nothing, if Pastor Noonan binds the hounds to the Tyrant's tomb, if the Cryptwood Tyrant is released, if Sly George survives, if the party takes control of the Silver Mine. There's a big party happening. You get an NPC cheat sheet, which is very useful. Uh, magic items that you can find in the adventure, as well as a pretty grisly piece of art there. Some potential replace uh, retainers or place replacement characters. Um, roll on page 43 of knock number three. So each character has one piece of interesting equipment. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I remember they did this for their other book too, where they had a potential retainers or replacement characters at the very back of the book. It's cool. I like that a lot. And then a uh, character sheet for the back page. Now again, if this book, if this uh, adventure is, is, if you're interested in it in physical form, you can uh, get it when it comes out. And I remember that the, the physical form, at least of the other adventure that they released, um, The Curse of Something Hollow, I think. <laughs> Again, I don't, I'll put the link below to where, where you can get it. Um, but the front cover came off um, and it could serve as like a little screen and it had a lot of the information right there. So I imagine this will be the same. Anyway, really cool adventure. The Horrendous Hounds of Hendenburg. The last one is Raiding the Obsidian Keep. Swing swords and face strange sorceries. Another great adventure. This is for level two through four, though, so it's a little higher than one through three. Um, this is an expanded, beautified version of the Obsidian Keep, pub originally published about four years ago. Now, I've never read the Obsidian Keep, the original, so this is uh, this is all this was all brand new to me when I when I got it. Um, uh, also, great art throughout. It's a different style, but it's really good. Different color palette, maybe, is what you see there. Once again, you get the background of the adventure. There is another. Uh, on the subterranean shores of the Sakine Sea stands the holy city of Radiant Vitella. In the center of the sea lies Isle Requia, where the lords of the Obsidian Keep harass passing ships with their magics. In the palace, Duchess Forza studied. Um, 
and master sorcerer. Her husband, Duke Avito, grew jealous of her power. One year ago, the Archbishop of Radiant Vitella secretly sent the Red Priests of Farmesh to seduce and corrupt Duke Avito. Two weeks ago, the Archbishop sent a fleet of holy warships to destroy the evil obsidian keep. The fleet never returned. No one knows what happened to it. So what happened? For the last year, the Red Priests have been driving Duke Avito insane, causing everyone in the Obsidian Keep to develop bizarre chaos mutations. When the fleet attacked Duchess Forza, used her sorcery to battle the invaders, but Duke Avito wanted the glory of victory, so he sacrificed his youngest daughter, Bianca, to summon the immortal horror of her mesh into this plane of existence. This eldritch summoning caused the Red Storm of Chaos, destroying the fleet and damaging the Obsidian Keep. Today, the shattered remains of the Radiant Fleet lie in the harbor. The survivors flee on rafts or huddle in shelters on the beach. Inside the Obsidian Keep, the palace is a nightmare. Only a few people remain alive, all horribly mutated, and some possessing unholy powers. Duchess Forza lies mostly dead in the Keep. Duke Vito lies entirely dead in his private sanctum, but he is not alone. Meanwhile, the people of Radiant Vitella wonder what happened to their holy fleet. So you can incorporate this into your, sit, into your uh, ongoing campaign <laughs> with ways of doing it. Um, anywhere off the coast near your port city, which is really, really cool, right? What that means is, once again, you have islands. That's my favorite. <laughs> so it's laid out very similarly to the other. You have rumor tables, hooks, um, great piece of art there. Harbor of Death. So this is the bay, your approach. And it's kind of like a point crawl, right? So as you go through, you can encounter this, this, or that. You move forward through it. Um, yeah, point crawling the bay and how to do that. I think that's really cool. You're going to be rowing your ship, your, your your sail, your sailing ship, right? Can't get into the bay. It's too too shallow or there's too many rocks or something like that. So you have to take a rowboat in. That'd be uh, how you make it a little bit slower and hit all of these locations as you get closer. Encounters in the harbor, D20, with some descriptions of those. And then the different locations in the point crawl. The capsized cutter, the wrecked frigate, the red glow, two masts, the white island, the black island. The Fallen Lighthouse, the Colossus, the Anchored Raft, the Tethered Raft, and the Wriggling Shape. Lots of great descriptions here. And the Survivor Beach. So once you get to the beach, there's another point crawl because you got to move up the beach to where the people are. And it's really great. There's lava flowing out into the water. A bright yellow stream of lava flows slowly down the slope from the Obsidian Keep across the beach and into the water with a big vent of steam. A lot of great locations here as you're going up the beach. Gold tents, stone arch. Barry Codges, the roaring bonfire of the survivors. And then you have the Obsidian Keep itself. Where is this place? On a steep promontory at the edge of a 300-foot cliff battered by winds and waves. What is here? Ruined castles, ruined castle, corpses, and some monsters. Who is here? Really great a breakdown of this location. It's much more linear. The other one is a region, right? Obviously a hex crawl. This one is a dungeon and a location. You have a description of the upper level of the keep. Going into it, main entrance, Inside the Obsidian Keep. Encounters inside the Obsidian Keep. The cellar going down. Locations level one. With, as you can see, it's a pretty big dungeon, 27 rooms, just on this floor, up to this floor. And then you have level two, which goes up to room 43. Lots of descriptions, horrifying things going on. It's a great, great dungeon. Level three, up to 55 rooms here. Dead lady, look at that horrible worm thing. A true eldritch horror that was once banished from reality and now wishes to return. Ending the adventure. So this is a much more straightforward dungeon. Highly recommend you guys check it out, though. It's really, really cool, too. Um, a great dungeon if the idea of this ruined keep that's haunted by mutating eldritch abominations apply, appeals to you, especially in an island as this is, then highly recommend you guys check these ones out so uh this was the raiding the obsidian keep the horrendous hounds of hendenburg and the secret vault of the windswept island i hope these all look interesting to you guys again they're not out yet for general um purchase but i'll put links below to where you can keep an eye on them and find out more about them and uh, i recommend them all when they do all right guys that'll be it i'll see you all in another video